Hey guys, Heather here from Naturally Present, episode three of the Naturally Present Life Series. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, super excited for episode three. I'm having a lot of fun doing these, but again, as I said in episode two, if you are here watching, whether it's live or, or preview, or uh, sorry, replay, if you could leave a comment below and let me know you've come. It gives me the feedback that what I'm doing has actually got some value and it's helpful for you. Also, if there's any topic that you'd like me to talk about, then please drop it into the comments. I'd be more than happy to, to, uh, to, to bring whatever conversation you're looking for to the table. And if I can't answer the questions, then I will go out and find the people who are working in that area that can come in and support. So before I welcome in today's special guest, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about focus. For me, especially in this uh, current climate of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, closures, although things are starting to shift, I, I have noticed that my focus is a little more challenging. For those of you that follow me, you know I have a consistent meditation practice. You know I tout the benefits of meditation and mindfulness, and absolutely I, I use those tools every single day. But I use a couple of other tools that have really helped me in the last little while. I and mean, we've got so many things going on. I run a couple of businesses. Um, I support other businesses. I have my husband and I both working from home. Our daughter is here. We're learning how to homeschool, do all the home learning here and help and support her in that. So there's a lot of stuff going on. It's like a lot of balls going up in the air, right? I'm the juggler. And I want to stay in focus with my meditation as the juggler. And then the mindfulness is that when I have something specific to work on, I pull that ball out of the stream of juggling balls and that's, that's where I put my focus in that moment, pop it back into the stream and pick the next one when it's time to work on a different task. So two tools I wanted to share with you um, that I have really committed to for just over a year now. I am very consistent and committed to these two things and they have helped me enormously. So I just bring them here to shed a little light in case it's helpful to you. Number one is the 5 a.m. Now for any night owls out there groaning, I'm not saying that you need to wake up at 5 a.m. You can find whatever works for you. For me, 5 a.m. works. I, my kid usually gets up between seven, eight, actually sometimes nine if I let her now that she's not going to school. But for me, having those first two hours of the day that are just for me is extremely powerful. And I've taken the time to hone in a ritual that really supports me in finding balance, finding clarity in the start of my day so that I can use that to carry me forward. It's things like I, I'm committed to, I wake up and there's the meditation. I drink my hot water with uh, lemon and apple cider vinegar in it. Uh, I do some stretching and some yoga, get my, my physical body going before I start taking in any food. I don't turn on my phone. I'm not looking at social. And the one thing I love most about 5 to 7 a.m., is that the rest of the world is still pretty quiet. There's not a lot of traffic on the streets. Their beautiful birds are chirping, but there's not a lot of energy around me. So it's a very focused time of day and it's very powerful. It also allows me to just get into the right space, do what I need to do for me before the family wakes up and I start to put on the different hats and, and start to pull on those uh, different tasks that I have throughout the day. Now, speaking of tasks, Here's my tool number two that I'm absolutely committed to. I call this my DOM. It's my daily operating manual. I have used many journals. This is the one I'm on currently. It's from the Global Grit Institute. Uh, thank you, Nita and uh, Ajit. So every single day, I start the day out by writing down the date. And you can see I'm using my highlighters and red pens. I write out the date and I highlight it so that I can always refer back to it easily. I'm a very visual person. And I write down all the things I want to do that day. Now, I write down my business things. I write down my goals. I write down my personal things like today's the day I need to take a shower or, uh, you know, to get my workout in or today's green smoothie or whatever it is that I want to make sure is a part of my holistic life. So it's not just a business to do task and it's not a family or personal to do. It's, it's, it's a full picture of what I need to do that day. Now, that doesn't mean everything on the list gets done. Quite often it doesn't. And that's okay because it allows me to filter things forward to, to following days. And of course, there's that satisfaction of crossing out with a red pen at the end of the day, the things that I did accomplish. And then starting, so every night, every morning I do my DOM. So I do my morning ritual, then I get into my DOM. So I'm clear about what I need to tackle. At the end of each day, as I'm just before I go to sleep, I pull it out and I make sure I've crossed off the things that were done. Or if there is follow-up, I use again, another colored pen just to write what's happening. You know, I sent that email, pending reply, whatever it is that's going on. And then the really important tasks that I know need to happen the next day, they filter down. 
So those are the two things, the two tools that I wanted to share with you outside of meditation and mindset. It's the morning ritual, making sure I get aligned for myself each day before I start and using the DOM, the D-O-M, the, the daily operating manual and how I want to operate my day. And uh, those two tools have really helped me with the focus, especially throughout this time where there's a lot going on. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in our guest. I see that she's now in the waiting room, so I'm going to bring her in. Kristen, are you there? I see your kitty cat. That oh. is not. <laughs> there we go. I apologize for that. No worries. I'm just going to flip to gallery so we're side by side. There we go. Awesome. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. The sun is shining. It's a beautiful day for a walk. It's life is good. Life is good. I just, yeah, I'm just so thankful for all the vitamin D we've been getting here on the West Coast lately. I feel like for our immunity, that's a really good thing. <laughs> oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's Friday. And how are you doing? Uh, good. Very good. Yeah. Um, really enjoying doing this show. And I'm super happy that you've come to join us. And I will say that I do have a plan after we're finished to take my daughter down to the river. We've been going every day. It's right at the end of our street and we usually wait in it, but today we're, we're like immersing. We're going in <laughs> today. So nice. we'll see how that goes. Yeah. It's going to be chilly. Do some Wim Hof breathing, get some yeah. energy going there and just you immerse bet. yourself. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to just do a little bit of an introduction. So I'm very pleased to welcome you. This is Kristen Swallow. Have I said it correctly? Yep. Perfect. Kristen Swallow, and she is the founder of the newly launched Bird's Nest Coaching, through which she provides support in the area of confidence, or more specifically in the area of what is known as imposter syndrome. A pretty big, hot topic these days, right? Kristen also lives in British Columbia, out here on the west coast of Canada, and you're in Maple Ridge too, right? Or you I am, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So we're neighbors, in a way, although I don't think we've met in person. No, I recently moved here. I moved here at the beginning of uh, quarantine. So I was here oh. just in the middle of March. Wow, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. If you need to know about the swimming holes, you can ask me privately later. <laughs> Will do for sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really, st this is the first podcast I've ever done. So I am, it's going to be a learning experience for sure. Awesome. Well, we're just going to have some conversations so you can share a little bit about who you are and what you do and how you help people. Lovely. Well, Sounds that's what nice. I like to do. So great. So my first question for you is that I, I'm really curious about the name for your coaching business, Bird's Nest Coaching. And I'd like to hear how that came about. Well, my last name is Swallow. Great. And I kind of took that and I was like, okay. And then I was thinking about birds and I really like how um, birds, when they're just leaving the nest, their parents don't like just boot them right away. <laughs> right. They give them some wings and make sure they can actually fly before they leave the nest. Right. And I would like that very much for my clients. I know my clients have wings and I know they're very capable of using them. And I want to see those wings, you know, in practice so that they can leave the nest and have confidence to do so. That is beautiful. That makes perfect sense. Now I get yeah. it. I love it. Yeah. And I also had the visual of the nest where being with the coaching session, like you provide that safe space yes. for them to spread out the wings and learn how to, how to, how to use them, right? Exactly. For sure. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. All right. So I would love it if you could just tell us a little bit about your journey, because I know you had uh, different work that you did prior to coaching, and this is a new endeavor for you. So I'd love for you just to talk a little bit about how you got to where you are right now. And specifically, if you could also focus on how you niche down to working with imposter syndrome. So how far back do you want me to go? Because it goes a while. Um, let, <laughs> let's start with when I finished my uh, bachelor's degree. I started working as a parent support coach with the Canadian Mental Health Association. Right. And I really liked coaching and I really liked being there for families and helping them out. And uh, it was a really amazing program that I worked with. So that kind of gave me the idea, okay, coaching is a thing I can do. Mm. And then I started my master's of social work program in the fall and I looked around and everybody was saying, you know, things like, oh, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not smart enough for this. I'm like, you're brilliant. What are you talking about? Mm. This is, you know, imposter syndrome. And a lot of my friends in academia have it. I have a friend who's doing her PhD in law right now. 
and she's the most brilliant woman I know, and I'm fairly certain will take over Canada one day. Wow. And she's like, no, nope, I'm an idiot. It's nothing. Wow. So I'm like, that's not an accurate description of your abilities. And, uh, and I started having conversations with my partner about this as well and saying, look, all of these people and, you know, me a little bit included are thinking that we aren't valuable members of society when clearly we're doing this work to try and do that. And he said, you know what? That's super common in the tech industry as well, where he works. Right. So he said that a lot of higher level developers have imposter syndrome and really identify with that because um, the, well, first of all, the industry is so new. Right. And secondly, a lot of people don't know what anyone is talking about when they talk about tech stuff, right? right. So, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, well, maybe there's a, a market for this. I love coaching and I would really like to help folks that I know for a fact have the ability to do what they're doing, but maybe not the confidence to think they do. Right. That's so I, yeah. So I developed this eight week program. Great. And I, um, I'm doing kind of, I've, I'm finishing up some testing on it right now awesome. and it uses self-compassion, which I really, really love. And, uh, that's kind of how Bird's Nest was born. Awesome. That sounds very cool. Is yeah. it, so do you run it virtually online or is it? Fixed? I do. Yes. Great. Yep. Perfect. That's, that's good planning. <laughs> yeah. It's telehealth. So yep. uh, when I was coaching via, for the Canadian Mental Health Association, it was also done by telehealth and that's the medium I'm kind of most comfortable in right now. So Great. perfect. That's awesome. So I'd like to know a little bit about your own experience with imposter syndrome. So I've done a lot of, uh, and currently I'm always doing a lot of training in the coaching industry. And it's a topic that even my highest uh, mentors still have experience in their life of, of it popping up and we have different tools. So I'd love, just love to hear a little bit about your own experience with that and whether you fully mastered it, which would be amazing to hear, or whether it's something that you still you know, manage every day or every so often. So I think that imposter syndrome is, um, it's really difficult to master completely because you'll always have that thought in the back of your head, that lovely little amygdala saying, yeah. excuse me, you don't belong here. You're not good enough. Mm -hmm. And um, for myself personally, I am a perfectionist. I am a self-admitted perfectionist. Um, I came to self-compassion honestly when I was doing some work with another coach actually um, quite a few years ago. I was like, okay, I hate myself. I am not good enough to be in this program where I am getting straight A's and graduating with honors anyways. <laughs> and she's like, Kristen, you got to have some self-love. Yeah. You got to have some self-compassion. So I started Googling and that's when I came up with, oh, there's actually been research done on self-compassion and there's a whole program around it. So that's how I have kind of managed it is um, just that knowledge that you know, this is a moment where I am having some feelings of imposter syndrome, like I might not belong here. A lot of folks in the world do, as has been proven by this point in time. There's a lot of research on it. Yeah. And that, um, may I be kind to myself in this moment? Beautiful. Yeah. 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 And do you, is it something that for you just pops up randomly or do you sort of, you know, find that things are happening in your life that maybe put you back in that state that you then pull yourself out of, or is it just sort of, you know, comes, comes and goes? Um, it kind of, it's more of a, when I'm launching into something new. So for yeah. example, I felt a little bit of imposter syndrome before coming on the show today, because I'm like, who right. am I to be interviewed? Why does she want to interview me? I don't know anything. And then I'm like, wait a second. I know an awful lot. I have designed this program. I've helped several folks through imposter syndrome. I think that I can be of some service here. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I experience very, very similar things. And I, I was just sharing with another coach I was talking to how often, because of the circles I run in, I assume that everybody knows the same information that I know. Mm -hmm. And it's just not the case, right? There's, we all have different bits of pieces of the puzzle to share with each other. And so by holding on to it and not sharing it, that's not, that's not serving, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it can really hold us back from sharing what's really important in the world, I think, imposter syndrome. 
Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And imposter syndrome. I mean, so many people just suffer silently with it, especially women yeah. because they're in positions of power potentially and saying, I don't know how I got here, but they're going to find out one day that I don't belong here and it's going to be a miserable downfall and they're living on eggshells because of it. Yeah. That they don't need to. Yeah, for sure. You're right. It's definitely a big thing for women that I've experienced too. And oftentimes they, we can easily accredit success or something that we're very good at or knowledge that we have to something outside of ourselves. You know, I got here by luck or it's because this person did this for me rather than just owning our own power uh, on the journey. Totally. Yeah. Amazing. And so do you also work one-on-one -on -one with clients or primarily just the program? I do work one-on-one -on -one with clients. I have, so I have the eight week program and then I have sessions for clients who want to work just uh, kind of a la carte on some coaching skills. And I also have sessions that are designed for folks that want to work on goals and have an accountability coach around goals, because that's something that I have kind of fine tuned a little bit, uh, the smart goal system. So <laughs> great. Accountability is so powerful. It can be, yeah. yeah. And just having that person to, you, you either have the shame of saying, no, I didn't. And shame <laughs> is a powerful, powerful tool, as we know. Yeah. <laughs> powerful tool, not a great tool, but powerful. Yeah. And, um, or the pride and accomplishment of saying, yes, I did do that this week, or I tried my darndest to do that this week, or I took right. my steps this week. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you don't probably know very much about me either, but what I, um, I do is um, my business is called Naturally Present. So it's very much about uh, meditation, mindset, and momentum. Those are sort of my three key areas. And so I'd be curious to hear what your take is on meditation and mindset, because clearly those are going to be a big part of you, maybe not in the meditation, but the mindset of helping your clients. So I just like to understand how that works into the business that you do. Well, mindfulness in and of itself is a core component of self-compassion, actually. It's one of the three core tenets. So I do in my eight-week program an entire session on mindfulness awesome. and how we can incorporate that into our daily lives and how important it is to be mindful of our own kind of thoughts and feelings and where we're at in that moment. Yeah. Because being able to like name it and claim it, as I say, <laughs> is... Um, it's the first step really to saying, okay, now I have acknowledged that this is a problem. How can I be kind to myself about it? What's good for me in this moment for this problem? Yeah. Beautiful. Love it. Yeah. So let's say, I'd like to hear if you met someone on the street, they're not a client, but just someone you're talking to and, and you can see what's going on for them, that they're sitting in this place of uh, lack of confidence in, in themselves. What would be the top tips that you would share with them? The top tips that I would share with them, I would say, well, do they have a pen and paper available? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> or um, they can type it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I would tell them to look up Kristen Neff and okay. her self-compassion work. I would tell them to think about their own strengths because our negativity bias kind of tips us towards thinking about the things that are wrong with us all the time. I mean, as humans, that's how we've kind of evolved. If we looked at a tiger or a banana, you were more likely to survive if you noticed the tiger. <laughs> so people evolve to say, okay, um, that's bad. I'm going to focus on that. And studies have kind of proven you need five positives to kind of balance out those negatives. And that works in all sorts of areas. So that works when you're parenting, that works when you're looking at self-compassion, that works when you are trying to have a balanced mindset, right? Right, yeah. So um, I would encourage oh. them. Sorry. Hi, Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> she, okay. she, she likes to get involved in sessions. So <laughs> um, yeah, so I would encourage them to kind of think about strengths and think about them not just in one area of their life, but to think about them in all areas of their life, in the personal, the professional, the relational, mm -hmm. and try and be thinking of them, you know, in that five to one balance if they can. Right. And it's hard. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you must sometimes come across people who at the, it's certainly at the beginning just can't pull anything forward, right? Yeah. So what, what, what do you do to help guide them through that? How would you approach that? 
So I acknowledge that it's hard, first of all, because especially with Canadians, if you walk mm. up and say, so what are your strengths? They're like, <laughs> um, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, yeah. But if you ask them to tell you a story about something mm. that they really enjoy doing or they really like or their family or their hobbies, for example, you can usually pull a lot of strengths out of that. So, yeah. for example, um, I had a client the other day who, who really loved travel. And I'm like, oh, so you must be very brave and you must be very organized because you're a solo traveler and you must be very independent. And she's like, yeah, I'm kind of all of those things. I'm like, nice. there you go. There's three strengths for you. Beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. That's amazing. Well, you mentioned um, hobbies. So in your bio, when I have a question about one of your hobbies, because um, let me just grab it here. You said that outside of coaching, you're reading, crafting, playing with a cat and dog, but also I might find you plotting a self-compassion revolution. And I love that. So I'd like you to talk just a little bit about it. You've mentioned self-compassion here, but I'd love to hear what your plot's really all about. <laughs> so my plot is uh, the hope that one day we will be teaching self-compassion instead of self-esteem in elementary schools that we will be using self-compassion uh, in hospitals with inpatient psychiatric patients. Who, um, I hope that, you know, places of higher education will be implementing self-compassion classes if they want them. Um, because it's just such an important skill to have. Studies have shown that your rates of burnout are going to go way down. Mm. Uh, productivity goes way up. Mm. Um, satisfaction in life goes way up. Perfectionistic tendencies go way down. Yeah. And I could go on and on and on. Um, and hey, it's this, quite a snowball effect too, right? When, when those things start rising, then they build upon themselves, right? Exactly. Mm. And the self-esteem movement um, that they have in schools right now has been shown to be not super effective. Um, in that it's very much still win-lose. Right. Right. Yeah. So even if you say everyone's a winner, eventually someone is going to lose and they're not going to know what to do when that happens. Right. It doesn't fit into the model, right? Yeah. You're supposed to have self-esteem, but you didn't actually come in first. Yeah. Exactly. So mm -hmm. that, and that crushes a lot of children because no one's taught them that it's okay. Look, not everybody came in first. You're okay. You're with everyone else. You're a very loved, valued member of society. Let's go have a popsicle now and have a cry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Definitely life skills. And I think that a lot of families are looking at life skills as part of the home learning that's going on right now as we're all learning to teach our kids from home. And it's a beautiful thing. Like things like we've, my kid's now mowing the lawn and, you know, making dinner once a week is part of her thing, you know, just things like that. And also the social emotional learning, it's different. They don't have the peers around them to uh it's online so it's a little bit different how they connect but it's such a, a, a an opportunity for for life skills to be presented in a, a little bit stronger way now that the kids aren't at school five days a week yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. Totally it'll change they're gonna go back <laughs> to school let's hope it all stays with them but yeah um okay great so i think that's all that's all the questions i had for you is there anything that you'd like to share about your business or about the work that you do here um, just that I, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, it's a newly launched business. So, um, but I am very available. I don't, this is not a side hustle for me. This is something that I am fully devoted to and involved in. And I really am loving helping the people that I am helping right now. And I'm seeing some great results. So we we're actually starting with, um, two self-assessments. Uh, one for imposter syndrome and one for self-compassion. And we take them again at the end of the eight weeks. And I'm seeing some really cool results. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. That results is really where it's all about when it comes to transformation, hey? It really is. It's, um, I have a degree in psychology. So stats and numbers are something that I understand and that um, I a lot of people see numbers and they're like, okay, there's actual evidence and numbers behind this. That's something that I can try. And then I go, okay, now you can trust me so I can teach you the skill that you need to trust yourself. Right. Beautiful. 
So you have space. You're currently open for new clients. So if anyone who's nice. watching this or listening to this, please note that, uh, and she does everything online. So you can connect with Kristen if this calls to you. We all battle at, with some uh, level of degree with the imposter syndrome. We all experience it. But I think that a big key, like you mentioned in the beginning, is really becoming aware of it because oftentimes it happens without awareness, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like a, a conditioned programming that we run through. So becoming aware of it, the next step after that is to then look for the solutions and the tools and the techniques that can help you work through it. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to do our closing questions, which I sent to you ahead of time. Yes. So what is your number one tool or technique that you practice every day to keep yourself in balance? I journal every day. So in my journal, it's not just like kind of random writing. I have a page where I do random writing, but I also have uh, a gratitude practice and uh, what would like a miracle question practice. So if today was an awesome day, what would that look like for me? Beautiful. Wow. That's very powerful. Yeah. And I found that um, it doesn't always go how I plan, obviously, <laughs> but I'm more likely to aim myself in the right direction if I know which direction I'm heading in right after breakfast. Right. Yeah. It's funny. I just, I always do a little segment prior to these interviews and I just talked about um, my, how I organize my mornings through my ritual and then my operating manual. So I make sure that I know where I'm going <laughs> because if you don't have direction, it can be very challenging. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Question number two, what is the one habit that you struggle with the most that you find it hard to be consistent with? So I'd love to have a, a regular yoga practice. I do have a sporadic yoga practice. I have the mat, I have the blocks, I have the intention. Yeah. Uh, it's a matter of actually going ahead and getting on the floor sometimes. Yep. Yep. Not alone in that. Definitely. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you're sitting with yourself five years ago, the five, five years from where we are right now. What is the one piece of advice you would give yourself? I actually have it tattooed on me. Oh, it says, keep going. Hmm. Nice. Um, five years ago, 10 years ago, I was not in the space where I am right now, but all that I did back then got me here. Right. Yeah. So just keep going, Kristen. You're going to get where you're going eventually. And I, that's what I would tell myself today as well. Just keep going. You never know where you're going to wind up five, 10 years from now. But if you're laying foundations now, you could be in a completely different space in five years. Yeah. It's going to take you somewhere, right? Exactly. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, what are you reading right now? If you're so reading. I am a reader. Uh, I have a little bit of like, I read this and that now and then kind of thing. Like I have my Kindle is full of books that I have intentions to read, but I, I'm always reading one nonfiction and one fiction Oh, cool! because um, you learn things from nonfiction. And I think there's just as many valuable things to learn from fiction. Definitely. So my nonfiction that I'm reading right now is Sapiens. Oh, and yeah. Kindle says I'm about 40% of the way through that one. Well done. <laughs> Um, and I'm finding that one really interesting. And then my fiction that I'm reading um, is called Dark Age. It's the fifth book in the Red Rising series by mm -hmm. Pierce Brown. Okay. Which is a kind of, it's a teen dystopian book, but um, I really enjoy it because he, first of all, the vocabulary is fantastic. Mm -hmm. He must have opened a thesaurus a number of times to do that. And it's teaching me a lot of words. Okay. Hi, Katie. <laughs> Sorry. And then um, it's also kind of founded a lot on principles that you see today with autocracy and meritocracy and who should be the ruling class for real. Right. Very timely. Yes. <laughs> awesome. And last question is how can people connect with you? So if you can talk about the platforms that you're on or your website, that kind of thing. So I can be reached in a number of ways. The easiest is probably just to Google bird's nest coaching because then my Facebook page and my website both come up. Hopefully I've done some search engine optimization on my, on my website. Oh, so. Well done. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm also on Instagram at bird's nest underscore coaching. Perfect. And those are my main methods of ways you can reach out to me right now. Fantastic. All right. Any last words before we sign off? No, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on today. And I'm really grateful for kind of this chat with you. It's opened yeah. up a lot. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. And I'm sure now that we've done this, that we're going to see each other when we're allowed back out somewhere in town. Yes. I'm sure we run in a lot of the same circles. So 
Yes. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you sign off because I'm going to stay online for a little bit. So thank you so much for joining us, Kristen. All right. I wish you awesome time in the river. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Bye for now. Bye. All right, guys, there you have it. That was Kristen Swallow from Birds uh, Nest Coaching. So imposter syndrome, I'm sure it, it's a fairly um, common term in the coaching industry and coaching arena. So it may not be something that you're familiar with. So essentially, it's like Kristen said, that voice where you doubt yourself, you feel like these other people belong in there, but I don't. And who am I to think I have anything to share that kind of stuff. So if you need some support or help in that area, then you can uh, reach out to Kristen and see, see what her eight week program is about, or also one-on-one -on -one coaching if you just need a little bit of support. But know that you're not alone. We all have it. And like she said, even before I come, every day, every time I come on before I do a live or a video, there's always that, that feeling. Um, sometimes it's a voice, sometimes it's just a, a feeling in my body of the imposter syndrome or the, you know, where oh, you shouldn't really do it, your, your hair doesn't look right or your, whatever, whatever it is. Something that wants to hold me back from really taking those steps towards my goals and the things that I'd like to accomplish. So I know I'm not alone in that and neither are you. So thank you so much for joining us on episode number three. And as I said, I'm headed off to the river now to go and immerse in some really cold mountain melt water. So <laughs> thanks again for joining and enjoy the day. This is Heather from Naturally Present signing out. <laughs> Thank you.